Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world today. Welcome to today's Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer session. Today we have Todd Miller and Ryan Ripley, two professional scrum trainers here. I'm Lindsay Velasina with scrum.org and I will be our moderator today. Let's get started. So real quick, before we dive in, I wanna go over a few quick items here. So your microphones will be muted throughout. However, we encourage you to ask questions. So please use the Q&A box in the bottom right of your screen and use that to enter your questions in for Ryan and Todd. You can start entering your Scrum questions in now and we will start going through them shortly. If you have any technical issues or just a comment to make or something like that, that isn't a question for Ryan and Todd, please utilize the chat for that. We like to try to keep them separate so we can get through the questions as many of them as possible. So a little bit very quickly about scrum.org. We are the home of Scrum and we were founded by Ken Schwaber in 2009. And we offer training and certification in professional scrum. We have over 350 professional scrum trainers around the globe, until, including these two wonderful people we have here today. And we also offer lots of free resources on our website to go and check out, including digital learning paths. So please check those out to continue your learning. And we hope that today's session plays a part in your continued learning as well. And with that, I will hand it over to Ryan and Todd to introduce themselves. I guess that's, that's me. I gotta, I'll introduce myself. So um, yeah, I'm, wearing, I'm sporting my glasses today too. We've been up pretty early this morning. So I uh, haven't thrown the contacts in yet, but my name is Todd Miller, professional scrum trainer uh, for over six years now, which is crazy to think about. Um, started as a developer, spent the first 10 years of my career coding software. Um, I uh, started, uh, used some extreme programming and found Scrum. Uh, that was my first endeavor into Agile was extreme programming. Uh, I was a product owner, uh, have been a Scrum master um, multiple times and coaching uh, and now um, own and operate uh, Agile for Humans LLC with uh, my good pal, Ryan Ripley over here. Ryan, uh, I know you're gonna copy and paste what I just said and add a little bit to that because our journeys are similar. Yeah. Um... Hi, my name is Ryan Ripley. I've been a trainer. I think I'm almost on my fifth year. So Todd's, Todd's got a, a little bit of time on me, um, but we've been training together and running Agile for Humans for the better part of the past two years now. Um, Co-wrote Fixing Your Scrum. A lot of things that Todd mentioned I, are very similar. Um, we have very similar backgrounds coming from a development, a software development background. I went more of the, the leadership management, executive leadership path, and then got back into being a scrum master. Um, and so we're both on the steward team. We spend a lot of time writing the content that's taught by the 350 plus trainers that, that Lindsay mentioned. Um, we just try to put a lot of effort into community as well. So we run a, a community there where people can get together and talk about Scrum and all of these great topics. We try to put out a lot of uh, YouTube content at the Agile for Humans YouTube site so that people can learn and grow. And we do events like this to help all of you. And so we hope that you're showing up with your best questions. We hope that we say something uh, helpful, inspiring, uplifting. Um, and we just hope that we're able to do something to, uh, to help serve all of you. Great. Thank you both. Uh, so now we are going to get into questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now and we will dive into those questions. So right. let's see, oh wow, there are some very detailed questions in here. So thank you Good. all so much for sharing them. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start here with this question from Scott. What are the best metrics to measure a team? How to make sure they are improving? I'd love to deliver value delivered, but value is so nebulous. Hmm. So what are the best metrics for a team? Ryan, should I start with something? Is that okay? Yeah, tee it up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, we, we are really big fans of evidence-based management. We use uh, evidence-based management to run our company uh, and we promote evidence-based management with all of our customers. 
And the reason being is evidence-based management, um, when it comes to the evidence side of it, so there's three aspects of evidence-based management, goals, evidence, and empiricism. Specifically drilling on the evidence aspect of evidence-based management, there's four uh, really areas that we'll talk about. They're called key value areas. And to me, those four key value areas combined holistically give you an idea of what might be happening with your product or your company or your portfolio. So um, unrealized value, uh, value that you have yet to fulfill that a customer may want, current value, uh, value that you're fulfilling today um, um, and with your customers, uh, time to market, and then ability to innovate. Those four key value areas, you would put metrics underneath them, key value metrics, and together when you look at them holistically, give you a really good understanding. So best, best metrics, one thing you might be frustrated with Ryan and I is that we don't think that there's a best metric for any situation. I think you have to be adaptable to the context that you're in. But universally, those key value areas and thinking about how to hang key value metrics in your context underneath them, we find to be a really, um, a really powerful way of looking at your product. Yeah. And if I were to add anything there, of course, I'm a big fan of EBM. As Todd said, all of our, the, the majority of our, our decisions that we make as, as owners of Agile for Humans, we, we drive off of EBM. And we're also big fans of Dan Conti's work. In, uh, and so when it comes to one of the areas that Todd mentioned, time to market, uh, we think that cycle time, throughput, um, item aging, and whip limits are wildly powerful, especially in that, in that area, in that key value area. And so I think a combination of EBM with, and uh, professional scrum with Kanban is just such a great combination of both delivery and value assessment that uh, I think that's a, just such a great way to approach um, metrics and delivery and measurement and validation. And yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. Great question, Scott, thank you. Fantastic. And I dropped some information into the chat with a link to evidence-based management. Um, there's an evidence-based management guide and some other resources there that you can go check out. So just a reminder to everyone, please enter any questions that you have into the Q&A box rather than the chat. That way, if we don't get to all the questions, um, we can easily share them with Ryan and Todd after this. So please make sure that they are in the Q&A box, just a reminder. So this next question, Commitment is important in Scrum. Delivering a product increment in every sprint is important. How can I bring up this topic for a team who is missing commitments repeatedly without being bossing and demanding? Yeah, so I think um, commitment is such a loaded word. Right. That it, that it can really shut people down. And so we really want to, so if I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that I'm in a Scrum Master role, Right, I'm, I'm fulfilling the Scrum Master accountabilities uh, in this situation. Um, if we're missing delivery each and every sprint, like if we're not getting uh, an increment created, it's a serious issue. Now, what this question could also mean, and since uh, I'm going to I'm going to make an assumption here, this could mean that you know the developers said that they would do five things and they put five things in their sprint backlog, but they only did four. And so they didn't meet their commitment. We see this a lot where plan versus actual is, is like this big thing that companies measure. And, and uh, we actually have a video on the YouTube site where it is a horrible metric. Plan versus actual does not tell you anything about value. It doesn't tell you anything about customer satisfaction. All it does is tell you that you cannot plan complexity and you cannot predict the future perfectly, right? And that's just for us, it's just like, duh, of course you can't. Now, if that's the, the idea, then I would get away from worrying about plan versus actual. What we want our scrum team to do is have a product increment um, that meets the definition of done that is usable by the end of a sprint. And if the teams are achieving that consistently and the value is there and the customers are delighted and the stakeholders are engaged and, and excited about the future, then I think you're doing well. Um, but if we're not able to get an increment released, right? So let's pretend that we're not doing plan versus actual, that we're actually um, committing to a sprint goal, not scope, and that by the end of the sprint, we're not meeting that sprint goal. Well, then it comes down to, we're going to hold that sprint review. And we're going to talk in a sprint review with our stakeholders and with our leadership and with our management, with the scrum team about what's going on that's preventing us from hitting that sprint goal. 
that's preventing us from having an increment, right? And then we're going to find ways to improve. And I, and I think you can do that without being bossy. I think it's a collaborative discussion. It's a everyone engaged and focused on hitting that goal. What do you think, Todd? Yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there when you were talking about the way that we view a commitment, right? The sprint goal is the commitment, not the PBIs in the sprint backlog um, and committing to being a good teammate. When we talk about commitment, when we talk about the scrum values, we talk about commitment from a behavioral aspect. We're com I'm committing to being a good teammate. I'm committing to doing the best that I can and working in high quality, right? We're talking about commitment as in the scrum framework. We're talking about commitment to a sprint goal, which is a very customer centric goal that shouldn't have ands, shouldn't have commas, shouldn't have run on sentences, right? It should be yeah. a really explicit, we need to accomplish it this sprint. So Ryan, I think that I'm just reiterating a lot of the stuff that you said around commitment. I think it is a loaded word. Um, and I think that we really need to get it out of our vocabulary that um, we, we commit during sprint planning yeah. to accomplishing these exact things. Because as you know, Ryan, we talk about all the time, it's like, how long do you think it's going to take? I think it's going to take an hour, right? How many times does that happen to you as a developer? And then four days later, you're still trying new things to try yep. to make that thing you thought that was going to take you an hour. That's complex work. We don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And, you know, it also reminds me of, of a Ken Schwaber quote. Like we love thinking about the things that, that Ken has written and said. And, and there's a, a clear quote in my mind that the point of Scrum is done. Right. And so that's why we're here. We're here to deliver. We are delivery focused. And so I think that's something important, Peter, that you can bring up with uh, with your team as well. The whole point is to deliver a, a high quality, valuable, usable product increment. And if we're not doing that, then what are we actually achieving? Great question, Peter. Thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks, Peter. There were a couple other questions that came in about commitment to I hope that that answered that. If not, feel free to drop follow on questions into the Q&A. So this next question is kind of a fun one. So what are some of the biggest mistakes you both have made, if any, in the early stages of your Scrum Master career? Early <laughs> stages? How about like every stage? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, not to, I mean, we'll definitely answer the question, but Fixing Your Scrum, the book that we wrote and that was published uh, in early 2020 has about a hundred of our stories where we totally screwed up and how we would go about fixing it. And so we hope you check out Fixing Your Scrum, uh, Practical Solutions to Common Scrum Problems. I think the biggest mistake I made was early on, um, I transitioned from project manager to scrum master. And I had, I underestimated the, the mindset shift that it would take. It probably took me a year to really get focused on the needs of other people, to, to, to step back from wanting to be the one to present in front of leadership, to get to kind of get my own agendas and my own uh, wants and needs kind of out of my head and realizing that I was there to serve a team, that, that I was there to uh, remove impediments and to work with leadership and to work with management, to be the agile coach of the organization, to remove everything that was in the way of the scrum team uh, that was preventing delivery. And it, and I underestimated that and I suffered through that and I had a lot of uh, issues with that. And I wish I would have put it, I wish I would have been more intentional kind of about that shift because that, that, that servant leadership, true leadership kind of shift, it is very difficult. And I really, uh, I think some more intention would have helped me early on. What do you think, Todd? Uh, I'm technical, right? Um, so um, what I had to really learn to do, uh, and I, I still have this problem, um, is when I'm a, a scrum master is I, I want to solve, I want to do the technical things. Um, I had that problem as a product owner too, right? Is I want to attend all the architecture meetings. I want to understand and, and, and like really nerd out on all that stuff when I have other things that I should be doing. Um, yeah. so I would say like one of my eternal struggles, uh, in being a scrum master is um is is not deliberately not dual rolling it because i can't my developer brain wins um so i would say that one of my big uh one, one of my, my biggest issue still today and early on is 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 is, is dividing dividing that so that's i think a, a real powerful thing um, for, for us to remember as to why being a dual role scrum master and developer is really difficult, um, because, uh, one hat always wins. And for me, it's developer. 
Yeah. Uh, so I, I prefer, I prefer just to be a dedicated scrum master and, and have to fight my, 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 uh, my technical stuff to, to stay, stay out of, stay well, out of those conversations. And I think the common thread here is that we're both like just naturally problem solvers. And so I would want to jump in from a process or a decision-making standpoint. Todd would want to jump in from a developer standpoint. And it's really resisting that urge to solve every problem for the team that is probably the common thread between our early mistakes, right? Not, not jumping in and trying to do everything for the team, but actually allowing them to learn the skill of self-organization and self-management, right? And, and we probably held some teams back early on because we didn't hold, hold back that, that problem-solving urge enough. So... I don't know. Great question, Alan. Thanks for uh, thanks for letting us highlight our biggest mistakes. That's a nice opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so this next question from Ray actually ties into some of the experiences that you both just shared. So how did you make the transition from a developer to a scrum master? And mm. how do you translate working in a scrum environment as a developer into the scrum master experience? So you kind of started um, yeah. talking a little bit about this, but if you want to dive in a little bit more also, um, Ray loves your podcast. Awesome. So we appreciate <laughs> that Ray. Um, yeah, that, uh, the YouTube site and the podcast are fun. Um, I think for me, uh, that transition from developer into project manager, scrum master, whichever, when, when you're leaving that developer path and that's a hard decision, right? I, I struggled with that one quite a bit. I had a great mentor who sat me down and basically said, look, you've got to make the decision. Are you going to be a great developer or are you going to be a great scrum master? Um, and you got to pick. And if you're going to go down this scrum master route, we're going to shut off your access to the code base. Right? When you, don't, you don't even have read only anymore. You're going to stay out of the code base and you're going to focus on the new accountabilities and the new commitments that you're making as a scrum master. Um, or you're going to stay a developer and we're going to find someone committed to um, bringing the scrum values forward on a, on a, on a scrum team who's committed to, you know, serving the product owner, the developers in the organization, who's ready to meet those accountabilities. And I made the choice and they shut off my access to the code base. And it was that, that step really forced that transition to, to really take off because I couldn't code anymore. So I really had to lean into that scrum master stance and uh, that scrum master set of accountabilities and, and a lot of the stances. What do you think, Todd? I actually didn't make the move from developer to scrum master. Um, I actually went from developer to product owner and uh, worked in the product ownership space for the better part of uh, maybe two, two and a half years, maybe longer than that. And then, uh, and then after I kind of finished this one product um, or was working as a product owner on this one product, I went back and, and, and really started uh, becoming more of a scrum master at that point. I, I, I so I will admit to you that um, I was a scrum master, product owner, and developer all at the same time. Um, you know, I read a book and I um, internalized it. At the I read the red, green, yellow book, Agile Product Management with Scrum by Ken Schwaber and Mike Beetle, and um, I did what I knew then. Uh, then actually. Uh, um, Kind of really made it known that I, I couldn't do it anymore and 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 became the product owner there and um, so I kind of stepped in from product owner to scrum master really is what I'm getting at um, but it, interestingly to segue from our previous conversation into this one is I still struggled not to take a developer stance uh, as a scrum master and still do today um, so for me it was developer, product owner, scrum master to product owner, to product owner, to scrum master. And, and I've um, been a scrum master a whole bunch of times really since, since those initial experiences. Yeah. Todd's still trying to figure out what he wants to be when he grows up. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't Great we all? question. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So this next question from Pam. So what kind of retros do you recommend for high functioning teams? Teams that like each other, trust each other, resolve impediments quickly. We get stuck in retros sometimes because everything is good. Sounds like a good problem to have. Todd, I think you know where my brain's gonna go here. I, uh, I love in this situation to fire up a Triz. I think the, I think the Triz will, will help uncover some things that perhaps we can still work on. I don't believe in perfection. Uh, there's gotta be something there. It's awesome. And so as a scrum master, first and foremost, you want to preserve the success, 
but I think a TRIZ could be helpful. So go to liberatingstructures.com, look up the TRIZ. I'll give you an idea here. Um, the prompt that, you, that I would use with the TRIZ is what could we do to make sure that the next sprint is a total disaster? And have them uh, fill out a, a board full of stickies or a, tr or a, um, a, a Miro or a Miro board, however you're facilitating it, and then walk through the steps of a TRIZ. And I'll, I'll let Todd expand on that if he wants to or give a different kind of approach. But I think that could really help uncover things, even if there's this assumed idea that everything is perfect and working great. What do you think, Todd? I was actually going to head in, in a bit of a different direction, although I love a TRIZ. Um, I would bring data into the retrospective uh, because that's uh, I'm a data dork. So yeah. Um, you could evaluate maybe the way that you're using EBM. You could start to look at some of the flow-based metrics that Ryan was referring to and some of the charts that accompany that um, and evaluate things like your, your um, if, if, you're, if, you've, if you've really um, started to implement professional scrum with Kanban, you could look at maybe where your SLE is and look at a cycle time scatter plot and see if there's outliers or things like that. I, I, I really think that um, high performing teams like that, like you're suggesting, uh, really could use a little bit of data as a, as a little bit of a flick to paint some reality of the fact that we still have a lot of places to improve. Um, so that, that's, that's sort of where I was going to, where I was thinking I would have. With I kind of like Todd's answer better. I think a situation is going to, I can't think of a team that wouldn't benefit from data. And so maybe that's the right approach, right? Get the data in place, EBM with some, uh, um, with some of the lean metrics and go there, but TRIZ can be fun too. It just depends mm -hmm. on what you're trying to accomplish with that retro. Mm -hmm. Todd, I think I like your answer better. <laughs> Thanks, Great Ryan. question. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both. Sure. This next question from Vic, what are your tips and pointers on making sprint reviews with teams, mainly doing backend work or focusing on a technical goal, such as migrating from couch database, successful in engaging stakeholders and making them glad they attended to give feedback. Hmm. Why are you doing what you're doing, right? So like, here's a, I might evaluate how you have your goal structured more than that, uh, more than more than trying to make a, a, a uh, stakeholders watch. Like I, one thing that always drives me crazy is watching stakeholders um, uh, see a presentation about like Postman making a web service um, return, right? Um, I think I, I think maybe the way that you're structuring your team and your goal, um, what I would try to do is why are you transitioning to Couch? What what who's your customer, right? Who's the customer? Why are you transitioning? What benefit is there to your customer? And if your customer may be internal, who's their customer? I really like to explicitly paint a path and goals to who the customer is and not just something technical, like we're going to move to couch because it's technical, it's a better technology. What benefit in, to your customers as a technology? I think a real easy example of this is moving from on-prem to Azure. How many times do we see that goal, Ryan? Let's move, Absolutely. everything's on-prem, let's move to Azure, let's move to AWS. Why? What are your customers getting out of that? Maybe, maybe your customer is getting more uptime. How do you prove that? What, what benefit is there to your customer getting uptime? Or maybe there's uh, your customer's um, uh, reaction time in your website or whatever you're building is faster because of it. So but I, I, would, I would probably uh, kind of, I think I'm going a little meta with this, but I, I would probably maybe evaluate how your goal is structured. And, and, and then that might give you better talking points for how you orchestrate a sprint review. Um, because I really want that goal to be customer centric and, and, and it, maybe it's something like, listen, if we do this with couch DB, this next sprint, we think that, uh, we'll have 3% more up top. I don't know, try to really paint a path to the customer. That's, that's, that, that's, that's my first take on it. Yeah. I, I think that's great. That's the way I would go too. And it's great to see Vic here in the chat. I think he's been in a few of our courses. And so thanks for joining us. It's a great question. Glad you're here. Hey, Vic. Fantastic. Thank you. So this next question, we currently use story points for estimating, but the teams are quite vocal about not wanting to do story points. Do I try to get them more comfortable with story points or try to get it and try to get it more accurate? Or do we move on to something else like determining cycle time and <laughs> use that for estimation? <laughs> Todd's head's on fire. Take it, Todd. 
<laughs> yeah, I was just in a big debate about this on LinkedIn. Um, I, uh, I'm a, a, I'll admit that the be- seven years ago, I was a proponent, and you probably can find some blogs out there about me um, to, uh, working with teams in story points and velocity. Um, but uh, the, there's a lot of damage that has been done in organizations with that. Um, I, and to be honest with you, it's cumbersome and no one really understands it. Uh, so why not, why not um, uh, Ryan, you referenced Dan Vacanti's work. Why not um, look at stuff that everybody understands and knows about? People know how to measure cycle time. When you start something and when you finish something, you measure the time it takes to get to start to finish. People understand throughput, right? How many time, things are we getting done per period of time? Um, and then um, that doesn't really totally solve for you how you give a forecast to stakeholders when people are asking you when it will be done. So you can feed throughput into something like a Monte Carlo simulation. Although all that same stuff can be gamed, we really need to make sure that when we're setting expectations with our stakeholders that we don't, um, that we don't imply certainty because we're working with complexity, right? Yeah, thanks. Um, I see someone in chat putting that, um, putting that up there. So um, I wouldn't coerce the team into using story points at all. You probably, if you're using a tool, have all the stuff that you need to measure cycle time and throughput. Um, I think the case in point here is um, don't misuse it, <laughs> um, and 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 I and I think that uh, uh, um, we keeping in mind how we talk about forecasting with stakeholders is 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 exponentially important. Yeah, I, and I think you know of, of course I agree with Todd's take on on using the lean metrics and and digging into Vacanti's work. I would just you know I wouldn't try to force any kind of method on a team. I'd be really careful. They're not, they may not be resisting the method. They might be resisting the coercion. I think I stole that from Esther Derby. I think that's one of her um, really awesome topics uh, in her new change book that I think uh, everyone should check out as well. Um, we need to think about why we're even using story points. There's two valid applications for story points. Trying to figure out the capacity of a team, right? Trying to figure out how much work we can take on during a sprint. That's usually in sprint planning. And then providing a very basic forecast um, so that the, the product owner can do some very rudimentary planning. That's it. And so if we're trying to do anything more than that with story points, we're probably making a mistake. Um, if we're trying to put any more weight on story points, we're probably making a mistake. Uh, and so really think about the purpose and could other, could other methods and other practices um, actually get us those same benefits or even more benefits. And I think that's, the, that's a discussion you can have with your team that's not as loaded. Um, keep in mind, story points, lean metrics, everything we're advising are complementary practices. Scum, <laughs> Scrum does not prescribe any of these. Um, and, and in fact, the word estimate doesn't even show up in the Scrum Guide anymore. So I think sizing is the new word. And so we're really arguing and debating and discussing things that, that are, are open, that are, are complementary practices. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this next question, I'm going to read it as clearly as I can here. Okay. So we are having big problems with our developers and our testers working as an overall scrum team and together in general. They see themselves as completely separate with separate jobs, et cetera. Any tips for getting them to work better together? Developers are throwing work over the wall to test and the bridge is getting wider instead of closer to meet our definition of done. Yeah, this is a, a common situation. And, I, and so we can speak generically about this, right? We're not working with you. We're not in the middle of of your situation, but um, from a theoretical standpoint, the Scrum team has three accountabilities, a Scrum master, a product owner, and developers. That means that the people writing the code, the people testing the code, the, the business analysts, the subject matter, all of those people are developers. And no one set of, there's no sub teams, there's no subtitles. And so it, it's, they're all equals, right? They're, they're equally valued on a Scrum team. They're all doing important work. And so if I'm a scrum master in this situation, I might promote, I might propose some ideas. You know, I love it when developers and testers pair or mob or ensemble program together. Uh, I think it, it builds a lot of sympathy for, for each other. 
Um, I think it builds a lot of um, a lot of a, a lot of camaraderie. I think it helps, you know, a developer who can really understand the pain of throwing code over the wall to a tester because they suddenly have to test things too. I think that helps with practices. It helps with um, just understanding what everyone's going through. So the more that we can get people to work together, the more that we can get them to collaborate and talk, I think the better results we're going to have. But without being specifically in your situation, it's really hard to go deeper than that. I don't know, Todd, do you have any, I'm sure you've got a good thought here too. I, you know, I don't know why I was just thinking about football with this. Mm -hmm. What happens to football teams when the offense blames, blames the defense for losing or the defense blames the offense for losing? Lots of problems. That's what I keep thinking. Yeah. Um, that doesn't, that sounds to me like a, like a broken team. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to call any specific teams out there, but Ryan, maybe your team. <laughs> No, so we've seen this and we see you see this in sports, right? When, 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 like, and I think NFL American football is, is a good example of it, right? Like the offense blames the defense, the defense blames the offense. That That's a losing team. That's a team that's not delivering. That's a team that's not winning generally, yep. right? You don't see winning teams blaming each other. And I, I feel like that probably is, 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 is happening in here and, ma and manifesting itself. What do we what do we have to do um, to get the 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 people on the team to understand that they are winning and losing together, right? And so I, I start to think of uh, it starts to sound like maybe even a non cooperating group of people yeah. that are handing off and casting blame. I, I'm I'm making a ton of assumptions here, right? Um, when when really it's a win or a loss together. Right. So that, that's right. I was thinking, I was thinking American football. Well, and, and I think there's a, a way that we think about testers in general, that's just incorrect. Um, there's this idea that testers, you know, bring quality into the product. There's this idea that testers are, you know, they find the bugs and, and maybe that's true in a sense, but I think what testers really do, and this can, I, I think maybe thinking of it this way could be interesting is that they really shatter the illusion that the code is perfect. And when you think of it like that, they're really a partner to the developer. They're helping bring reality and truth to the code base. And, and so I would hope that that would be valued, right? As, as something that's important to, to quality, that's important to delivery. And, and to Todd's point, like we got to get these, these individuals actually working as a team. And I think the more that we can talk in that direction, uh, mm. the better things could potentially be. Great question. Thank you both. So this next question from Jimena is one that others might relate with too. So I work with, I work in the gaming industry. The games have releases every month with business as usual tasks also uh, to keep the game going with revenue. So, however, we also use, we Sorry, I'm butchering this. <laughs> However, we also have new features that are included in those releases. We only use one scrum team and use the work everything in the same sprint. So how would you handle sprint goals when you have business as usual tasks and new features to be released? You know, there is this idea that everything on the sprint backlog has to relate to the sprint goal. And we've watched countless teams struggle to come up with a coherent sprint goal, given the disparate type of work that's on a sprint backlog, very similar to this situation, right? And so I'm going, I, I, I think this will be helpful. Only one item at minimum has to relate to the sprint goal, okay? So if you set a sprint goal that you're enabling, and again, to Todd's previous point to Vic's question, um, that sprint goal and product goal, right? Those tie back to customer. That's a team, that is a scrum team's connection back to the customer. So that sprint goal is, is enabling a customer to do something. It's that new feature, it's that new thing. Um, as long as you have at least one item on your sprint backlog that relates to that, that thing for the customer, you're great. And you can have five other bugs or other things you're trying to do but here's the deal, your commitment is to that sprint goal and you can't let anything get in the way of that sprint goal. So that item that's related to the sprint goal has to be most important, but there can be other non-related things, other bugs, other spikes, other tests, other things you're trying to do 
that are on your sprint goal, and that's perfectly fine. You're allowed to do that. So not everything on the sprint backlog has to be directly related to achieving your sprint goal. That's a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, All great right. question. So this next question from Rob, another team related question. So how do I help my team work effectively and to be a team when we're working in multiple locations in different time zones? Stakeholders, product owner, and scrum master are in one region, and most developers are in another. The developers are quiet and don't take ownership. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I think we're just working in a world where there's uh, where there's uh, um, it, it, multiple time zones all over the place. I, I'm interested in pot potentially what you're what you're what you're trying to do and. And how you're trying to operate with this team for, for me i mean if if you have the po potential possibility on doing it i like to get face time with the developers understanding though that since 2020 that's been a little bit difficult um and i i, I wonder if you say the developers are quiet and not taking ownership if that's as to be blunt if that's an assumption on your behalf right um so i i feel like there's this assumption that developers are inherently um not commit not like committed to being a good teammate or committed to doing the work well um, when we don't know, it's just that we're far removed from it, right? So I, I think that a lot of developers are quiet, um, but I'm interested if they really are not taking ownership or if you're just assuming that they're not because they're not communicative enough. And so I, I think that we probably need to, um, we, we probably need to share the pain a little bit here with time zones. And and also if I'm a scrum master on this team, uh, I, I, I think I'm really going to um, emphasize the accountabilities here and and um, I don't know. I, I just keep for for some reason the not taking ownership thing is sticking with me because I feel like we're seeing that a lot. A lot of people, right? And I feel like we're hearing a lot of people say developers aren't taking ownership. When you drill in and you talk, and they really are, right? Um, so I, I feel like that's been a topic that we've we've addressed quite a bit recently on our uh, podcast. And uh, sorry, uh, Rob, if, if if that's a false assumption um, on my behalf, that 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 just triggered a, a conversation. I feel like we've been in multiple times in the past uh, in the past couple months, and um, and and maybe maybe lending a little bit of trust there could, could go a long way. You, you know, Todd, we I wholeheartedly agree with you. We're seeing this come up more and more, and I and I often wonder, especially in this setup where you have. Scrum master, product owner, and stakeholders in one area and developers separated from that, where's the developer representation? Mm -hmm. And so I, I've often wondered, does it make sense to actually have the scrum master with the developers, right? Does it make sense to, instead of having the scrum master almost as like a leadership team with stakeholders and PO, does it make sense to get some of that representation with the devs? And so it could make sense to actually have a local scrum master helping these developers feel like they're a part of this disconnected kind of setup, right? And, and so we've seen some teams try that and it's worked pretty well. Um, but this is, a lot of this is really new territory. Yes, there's been remote teams prior to COVID, but now there's a lot of remote teams and some of the, the struggles and the pains are becoming very, very big, very obvious. And I think we've got a lot of work to do in this space, but I think local representation, maybe a local scrum master working with a product owner and stakeholders who are um, in a different region could make a difference. But again, we don't, we, we don't work with you. We don't know the, yeah, the yeah. details, but that's one thing we've seen tried in certain contexts that, uh, that have worked pretty well. Great. Thank you. So this next question somewhat ties into that, um, but tying into self-management anyway. So how do you get a scrum team to really take on self-management? The team is always asking the PO what she wants or asks them to tell them what to do. Stop answering the question. Look, we've set a product goal. We've set a sprint goal. Uh, we, in sprint planning, the product owners should be collaboratively working with the developers to figure out what could, what could be worked on to achieve that sprint goal. But once it's time to work, uh, the developers need to own that own that plan, uh, check on that plan daily in their daily scrum, plan their collaboration for the day, and, and learn how to do that. I think the scrum master can step in and provide some coaching, but I think if we want people to own things, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen um, a scrum master or a product owner take a very directive type stance with a team. 
They like, they, they tell the teams what to do. They try to solve all their problems, but then they'll step back, step back and say, I don't know why they won't self-manage. And so we have to resist the urge to solve those problems. We have to stop answering that question of what should I do next, or at least give a different answer. The answer would be, what's the next most important thing to do to achieve the sprint goal and have the developers go off and do that, right? Have them sort through that. And until we until we stop answering those questions so directly and until we actually give them the space and the safety and the ability to make decisions, we should not expect um, self-organization. The, the other thing that we see or that I see as one of the uh, leadership stewards uh, with, with scrum.org is that we see leaders who will say, you know, we, we don't see teams self-organizing. And so we'll start asking questions. What are the boundaries? What are the constraints? What are the goals? Like, what are the, the guides and guards that they're bouncing up against in this self-organization? And, and they'll, we'll get a blank stare. And people, well, we don't have those in place. And then, so fine, you should not expect self-organization. You should expect chaos. If there are not guides and guards and boundaries and goals, then what are you expecting people to self-organize towards, right? So there's probably some work to do at a leadership level. There's probably some work in coaching to do with your product owner. And if you're a scrum master who's stepping in and making the call, maybe there's some work to do on yourself. And so lots of different areas to investigate. I don't know where the issue could be um, because I'm not in your situation, but I hope those are at least three areas for you to consider. Great, thanks, Ryan. Sure. So this next question is an interesting one. So as a scrum master, when I am not busy with scrum events or other meetings, I find that I don't have much else to do. What am I doing wrong? What can I do to keep myself busy? So I want to add on to this and ask, what, what should you be doing as a Scrum Master? Well, there's this notion out there, if you looked at, at um, a lot of LinkedIn um, job descriptions for Scrum Master, that the Scrum Master is exclusively to be working with a Scrum team. And, and oftentimes, um, at best, we'll see these job descriptions describe a scrum master as a, as a glorified team manager. And we couldn't agree with that any less. Um, so we, we view the scrum master as the agile coach. We view the scrum master as a teacher. We view the scrum master as someone that takes action. Um, check out Barry Overeem's uh, hard work that he's been doing on the stances. I think he just revitalized those. The scrum master is a change agent in an organization. And so we always will say that a scrum master's job is fulfilled when every single organizational impediment is resolved. And so if you're working in a consulting agency, how are you structuring your contracts? Uh, or if any company, how is funding happening on your projects? How, um, how are departments structured? There's all these things that organizations will say they're using scrum, but they fail to adapt. And uh, we blame the scrum master for that. We, we blame unempowered scrum masters for that. So uh, realistically, a scrum master should be out serving the organization. So that, and make sure that you're, that you're in the saddle with your product owner. Product owners need help. So I would say working with your product owner and, and, and maybe helping them a little bit with stakeholder management and making the product backlog transparent, but um, serving the organization. That's oftentimes where we see people missing the, missing the, um, missing the ticket with scrum mastering. Great. Thanks, Todd. This next question is actually on a different end of the spectrum with the Scrum Master. So as a Scrum Master, where do you draw the line on removing impediments versus solving the team's problems? If you're removing all their impediments, how does that enable self-organization? Should you only focus on removing those things outside the team's control? Yeah, so I, I think the line that, that I've typically drawn throughout my Scrum Master career is that I won't solve an impediment that the team is capable of solving on their own. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had a, a team member run up, Ryan, I need a new laptop. Can you enter the ticket for me? And, and I just kind of smile and I say, wow, that sounds really complex. I can't wait to see how you solve that. And I walk away, right? That's something that they can take care of. They can figure out how to get a laptop ordered and delivered. They can figure out where to go to lunch right? They can sort out, you know what? They can actually schedule their own scrum events. Why does the scrum master own all of the calendar invites, right? This is something they can solve. Now, if there's an organizational impediment that's, pre that's preventing delivery, that's when I jump into action. 
right? That's when I find the vice president who's got the budget that, that can buy the thing that we need that gets us back to delivery, right? That's where, where I, I draw that line. So if the team, if the scrum team can solve that issue on their own without my involvement, I don't get involved. But if it's beyond the team, if it's in the organization where partnership with leadership and management is required, that's typically where I spend the bulk of my time. I don't know, Todd, anything, anything different there? Great. Great. Thanks. This next question from Derek. So he had asked a question earlier and I had asked for more context. So Derek had attended an, a PAL EBN class recently and he had said that, you know, you had discussed net promoter score a little bit and he yep. kind of wanted some clarity on how the scrum team would use net promoter score. So since Todd is one of the co-creators of the EBM class, I'm going to let him take this one. So how do you use net promoter score? So net promoter score is a sign of value that you've delivered in the past. So net promoter score would be a key value metric that you would put under current value. And so um, specifically how Ryan and I use it. So uh, we, Ryan and I, at the end of every single scrum.org class that we teach, we ask for a net promoter score and it's a really simple mechanism to do it. On a scale of one to 10, how was our class and any feedback that you can give us to make it a 10, we'd appreciate. And what we do is we trend that, right? So if we find that a PAL EBM class is a 7.6 median score or something like that, um, we want to do anything we can to make it trend towards a 10. And so we have identified the way that we facilitate and operate our courses just based off of that. And we'll change uh, and look for common themes uh, in, in order to improve it. So for net promoter score, how does the Scrum team use that? To understand what current value they've delivered to a customer. And that might be something that they want to target to improve or they're okay with. Uh, so really, I, I, I've tried to get a little bit of an example about how Ryan and I use that and how we collect it. There's a lot of different ways and met means and methods for you collecting net promoter score. We just really have a super quick and dirty way of doing it. Um, but usage of it is to understand a little bit. That's one mechanism, one thing that you can look at under current value. Um, so hopefully, hopefully I answered your question there. Thanks, Todd. You're welcome. So this next question. Hi, Ryan and Todd. How would you explain to your team the importance of the Scrum values for successful adoption of Scrum? You know, Todd came up with a really excellent question in our PSM class. Um, when we teach the scrum values, we, we walk through them. We, we talk through focus, openness, commitment, courage, and respect. We talk about how those could manifest positively on a team. And then Todd had this great idea in one of our classes. And this was just kind of a on the spot thing. He said, you know, let's spend five minutes in some groups. And we want you to talk about what would happen or what would you observe on a team where these values were absent? And I thought, man, what a good question. And then and the, the first time we ran this, uh, the team came back with a board full of really horrible things. Like it was a really, it was almost like a, a post-apocalyptic scrum world where, I mean, the, the people would be hiding their work. They wouldn't share knowledge. They, um, they would be competing with each other. We would never deliver anything. Um, it would be a miserable place to work. I would find another job. I mean, it was just a really wild board full of stuff. And I thought that was just so effective. What a great question. So, so basically what I'm recommending is do a teaching block about the values and then pose Todd's question to the group after you walk through what each value means. And I think that will answer the question for themselves. So you don't have to convince anybody. They're going to self-discover, whoa, wait a minute. If focus, openness, commitment, courage, and respect are not present, life is bad. And the, the, it's not joyful work. And we're probably not going to do well at delivery. Um, but let them discover that rather than try to convince them, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've also run some retros around the Scrum values um, and just ask a simple question, uh, you know, uh, like alone and in silence, uh, put some stickies up. And even if you're using something like Miro or Mo Mural or something like that, put in anonymous mode if, if you need to have that safety and just say, where are we strong and where are we weak? Yeah. Uh, where can we improve and, um, and where do we feel like um, we can pay a little more attention to you know, another thing we like to do is we like to, um, we like to, another activity is to order the scrum values by what's most important in a context of a situation, yep. right? Um, because 
Um, to say that all of them need focus all the time is probably a mistake. Uh, there's certain times where as a scrum master, you can evaluate a room um, by a scrum value, right? Like, what can I apply here? Uh, what, what scrum value or what question or what method or what facilitation technique can I apply? Because I feel like this room needs a little bit of courage or maybe this room needs a little bit of focus, which is probably a problem in your area. So I, I feel like there, there's just the scrum values. There's so much there to explore um, that I, I don't think you want to coerce the team into it as Ryan to pull up a point you said earlier, but and Ryan, you always know too that for me, one of the biggest things that I love about um, the Scrum Value conversation is the quote from Kempek's book, Extreme Program. I've used it a million times. Uh, is that without values, practices become rote, meaning we just do them for the sake of doing them, right? And so you hear zombie Scrum, bad Scrum, those kinds of things. Without values, practices become rote, meaning you just do them for the sake of doing them. So it's really important to to call attention to them. Great. Thank you. Um, this next question, how can Scrum Masters without a technical background be successful? Can they be successful as someone without a technical background? They could possibly be more successful than a Scrum <laughs> Master with a technical background. It's, um, I think it's really player's choice here, right? I, we all, so one of the best, it, what's interesting about uh, this profession, um, whether it's developer, scrum master, or product owner, one of the best software developers I ever worked with had a, had a degree in music, right? Didn't even have a CS degree. His background was in music theory and just wrote amazing code. Um, I think there are many roads to scrum mastery. There's many roads to becoming a scrum master. Todd and I happen to have started in software and then moved into different avenues of scrum and, and, and different accountabilities. Um, I would say that not having a technical background might have helped me pull out of the weeds of the work sooner. So it might have actually helped me uh, early on in the career uh, as a scrum master. I don't know. Maybe sometimes it's a help. Sometimes it's a hindrance. What do you think, Todd? I think it hinders me having a technical background. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, like, so where, where, I mean, I have, I, I have really big areas where I, I could absolutely improve as a scrum master. I feel like I could improve my coaching stance. Yeah. I feel like, uh, I've worked very, very hard because facilitation doesn't come natural to me. Um, I'm not a overtly, uh, um, let's say it took me really, if you, if you, if I went back and remind myself to 10 years ago, and I said that I would be doing what I'm doing in a profession, um, I think some of the people would probably, if I could rewind back to that, laugh because I didn't even want to talk in meetings with like three people and I was like nervous about everything. Um, so I think that uh, I think that all those skills, if you're not technical, uh, you just work on you just work on areas where uh, where your strengths are. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses, right? For me, my, um, I was pretty strong technically, and so I always it's it's a strength because I can talk that talk with the rest of the developers, but it's also a weakness because I love to talk the talk, right? Um, so I, so I, I wouldn't necessarily view being technical, um, uh, not being technical as a weakness, uh, just really concentrate on the other stances and, and, and build yourself into the scrum master that, that you wanna be and, and not focus on, um, uh, on, on the technical aspects of it. Although I will say it doesn't hurt to open a book and read about it a little bit. It really doesn't in your domain, understand that. So if you're working with a scrum team that's you, that's marketing, read a book on marketing, um, read a book on software. It doesn't mean you have to code, just have an idea of it, right? Just um, ha have some kind of idea so that, so that you can have a little bit more empathy, right? That's really good advice. Thank you. I, have, I usually have one piece of good advice a uh, year, Lindsay. <laughs> Well, I think you both have shared quite a bit in this session here. Um, so we have time for maybe one or two questions. I, there are tons still open here. So I will be sharing these with Ryan and Todd and they will figure out a way to address these with you um, after this session. I would so, imagine they're gonna show up on our YouTube channel. You all have actually helped us uh, figure out some questions going forward for your daily scrum. So thanks. <laughs> I figured it may show up there. <laughs> so this next question, so how do you handle product owner and leaders that mistake servant leadership with product owner assistant? Yeah. What do you think there, Todd? 
could, I'm not sure that I completely follow the question, Lindsay. Do you think you so could ask I think me? so. I think the context and Gail, if this is incorrect, um, please let us know in the chat. But so, how do you handle a product owner and leaders that mistake servant leadership for just being an assistant? Uh, yeah, so I think this is where if you look at um, the Scrum Guide 2020, where it's now true leader, um, what, what I what what I found and uh, is that a lot of people mistake it as 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 the servant aspect of it, right, where you, know, you refill cake cups, right, it, it, not the leader aspect, you know, we tend to ignore that. So I really appreciate the change in Scrum Guide 2020 and calling it true leader. Uh, yeah, Tyler just put in a chat team admin. A scrum master is not a team admin. In fact, I will adamantly refuse to do that work. Uh, um, as they'll be like, okay, let's update the sprint backlog. I'm like, cool, I can't wait to watch you update your sprint backlog developers, right? Um, it, it, it really, uh, I, I think that subtle language change in Scrum Guide 2020 is vitally important um, to us being able to uh, to, to make the changes that we need to, you know, kind of circling back to the LinkedIn job description for scrum master, which we need to do quite a bit of work on. And changing everybody's view of what the scrum master is a scrum master is a true leader that should have the organizational authority to help to make change right it's not a team admin it's not a tool admin it's not a person that makes sure that coffee is stocked it is a change agent in an organization right yeah totally agree thanks so i think we have time for maybe one more um so I'm going to pull from a question. We're not going to get to the full context of the question because we don't have the time. But what are your best tips for improving internal stakeholder engagement? So in our book, we wrote some some chapters on this. I'll, I'll give away the um, kind of the, the core theme here. Everything that we do, and I think this is something Scrum Masters could be coaching product owners on. Product owners could be really doing some deep work here. When we're working with stakeholders, we really need to be conscious of the fact that everything we say should in some way be geared towards that stakeholder, right? I don't think most stakeholders care about sprints and story points and, and all of that stuff. They want to hear how what we're doing benefits them. They want to, they want to hear, um, they, they want to hear how what we're doing makes their life better. They want to hear how what we're doing enables them to sell something to someone else, right? We need to learn to speak in the terms that stakeholders care about. If I walk into the CEO's office and she starts asking me about the product development aspects of our work, I'm not gonna talk about sprints and scrum masters. I'm gonna talk about uh, the effectiveness of the team and our ability to deliver value sooner. And, and when the CFO walks in, I'm gonna talk about revenue recognition and I'm gonna talk about the impact um, that our work is having potentially on, on the balance sheet and on the customer retention. And I'm, I want to learn how to speak in a way that matters to the stakeholders, right? And to figure out what they value most and make sure we're delivering on that. Um, and I find that that outward focus uh, really helps get those stakeholders engaged and interested and asking better questions about what's possible as opposed to uh, how do you raise your velocity by 10%? You know, that's a question that's filling space, but when you actually engage them in a meaningful way, I think the questions get better, the engagement gets better, and, but that takes a lot of work. And so you have to really do the hard, deep work about what your stakeholders really want. Let's stop showing on PowerPoint. No PowerPoint. Like, so the sprint review is supposed to be a collaborative working session. I, I, I don't know. I can't tell you the last time I had a collaborative working session with someone showing me a PowerPoint. <laughs> Todd, what did we start the webinar with? Yeah, well, that was a quick, yeah, that was a quick, uh, that was a quick, uh, that was a quick show uh, kind of setting the stage for everything. But like, uh, it, it just, uh, it, to me, like sprint reviews that have that, like, I think, you know, Ryan, that I'm pretty passionate about the fact that the sprint review is the most underserved scrum event that there is. We have so many innovative and, and interesting ways to run sprint retrospectives, but I do have a feeling that a lot of them are run for false purposes because we haven't maximized the sprint review. Yeah. So um, maximizing a sprint review isn't pushing information on people through a PowerPoint and a demo. It's having real collaborative conversations together. Thanks, Todd. And with that, I will not go back to our PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we are we are at our time. I want to thank you both so much for joining us here today. Like I had mentioned earlier, any questions that we didn't get to here on the live session, we will pass those over to Ryan and Todd to address. So thank you everyone for attending today. Please be sure to check out the Fixing Your Scrum book by Ryan and Todd and also their YouTube channel for Agile for Humans, as well as the scrum.org YouTube channel and all of the resources on the scrum.org website. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you, got, see you all again on another session. Scrum on.